Um, thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Stacy Matrazo. I am the program manager for the Florida Wildflower Foundation and I am here to talk to you about um, our new book, Native Plants for Florida Gardens. Um, hang on, not advancing, there we go. Um, if you're not familiar with our organization, uh, we are the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat through education, uh, research, and planting and conservation programs. You can learn more about what we do and um, check out all of our amazing resources at uh, our website, flawildflowers.org. Our work is made possible primarily through the sales and renewals of the Florida State Wildflower License Plate. You see here our old look uh, in 2018, we updated it with this awesome new design. Um, old or new, it still supports our mission. Since 2000, we've uh, received more than $4 million in license plate donations. Um, and again, that funds the projects and programs that we offer. Um, if you like our programs, um, if you find our programs valuable, we do encourage you to become a member, make a donation, or of course, purchase the uh, State Wildfire license plate. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off so it's not distracting me and you all. Um, so I'm here today to talk about our new book, Native Plants for Florida Gardens. This was written um, for the Wildflower Foundation by myself and Nancy Bissett. Many of you probably know Nancy. She's a member of our board. She's a biologist and restoration ecologist. Um, and she and her husband, Bill, are the owners of The Natives, Inc., which is a native plant nursery and consulting design firm located in Central Florida. We wrote this book with the hope uh, that it will encourage people to add more native plants and give them the confidence to do so by presenting easy to use, a easy, easy to use guide um, with plants that are um, you know, generally available and easy to manage. Um, the more we encourage people to use native plants, that will in turn encourage and attract more pollinators like native bees and butterflies, um, provide food and habitat for wildlife, and add more connections and pathways through our urban areas to our natural areas. So Florida is one of uh, the most biodiverse states in the country. We have about 2,800 native plant species here in Florida, including more ancient species and more families than any other state. But we're also one of the fastest growing states in the country. And as Florida, and as our natural lands succumb to increasing development to accommodate this growth, we are losing this incredible diversity. And I, I like to include this quote from Doug Tallamy. Um, if you're not familiar with Doug Tallamy, you really should be. He's the author of several books um, on the importance of planting natives in our landscapes. Um, we hosted him on a webinar a couple months ago, and you can view that on our website, as well as our YouTube channel. But Doug says biodiversity can't be sustained in habitat fragments because they're too small and too isolated. So wildlife need not only these vast expanses of natural lands, but they also need safe passage through our urban areas to what are now largely fragmented habitats. They need to be able to find food, shelter, and resources. But we're developing our natural lands so quickly, they're becoming smaller and more isolated. So we need to look to our urban landscapes to help bridge that divide between those fragmented natural areas and provide pathways for birds, pollinators, and other wildlife to move safely and find the resources that they need um, while, they're, while they're moving through here. You don't need uh, acres and acres to do this though. Even the smallest native garden can provide essential resources for wildlife. So to share our built, our urban environment with wildlife, we just need to do a couple of things. First and foremost, we need more native plants in our landscapes. We need to tr transition from um, these commonly used non-native ornamentals that have little ecological value to native ornamentals. And yeah, we do have native plants that have ornamental qualities. 
Um, many of our native plants provide year-round interest with flowers, fruits, colorful foliage, interesting shapes and forms. Um, they can all offer the same aesthetic or, or a, a pleasing aesthetic like our non-native species can. We also need to reduce the amount of lawn in our, lawn, in our yards. Um, you know, we mow them, we herbicide them, we put pesticides and fertil fertilizers on them, rendering them ecologically useless. So all they're doing is really just giving us more heartache, right? It's a lot of work, a lot to maintain, and it's not providing any value. Um, so if we can get rid of it, great. If we can reduce it, that's great too. But when we do these things, when we plant natives and we reduce our lawn, we invite wildlife into our landscape. And by doing that, by showing your neighbors a beautiful, thriving um, yard with native plants that's all alive with um, birds and butterflies and other activity, we hope that that will encourage them to do that as well. So if I have a native yard and then you turn your yard or add some natives and your neighbor and so on and so forth, we start building these pathways, these connected landscapes that provide those resources for wildlife moving through. So as I mentioned, Florida is home to 2,800 native species. These plants have evolved with our state's unique soil and climate conditions over thousands of years. That means they have been in uh, the, the adaptations that help them endure Florida's sometimes harsh conditions like drought, salt, hurricane winds, seasonal climate fluctuations. Um, they're better suited than the non-native species to survive in these conditions. And they're better equipped to provide food and habitat to our native wildlife as well. And that includes the pollinators that we need for our own food production. Native plants also, um, if they're used effectively, if you put the right plant in the right conditions, it's gonna require less water, uh, less or no fertilizer, herbicides or pesticides compared to our non-native counterparts. Um, they, you know, again, our native plants evolved here with these pests, quote unquote, and so they're better equipped to, to um, adapt or handle them without adding all these chemicals. Native plants also give nutrients back to the soil that it needs to sustain other plants and organisms. They help control erosion. Certainly they beautify our landscapes and they're a part of a healthy, diverse environment. So a good habitat, a good uh, landscape has a variety of plant types. And so we've included a variety of plant types in our book. Um, wildflowers, um, obviously they add a pleasing aesthetic, um, these beautiful colors and unique flower forms, but they also provide nectar and pollen. They even provide nesting opportunities for insects. Um, a lot of insects will overwinter in the hollow stems of plants or wildflowers that have already um, died back, so it's good to leave those in your yard if you can. Um, they also provide seeds for birds and they attract the insects that insect eating birds like too, so they're a really good resource in addition to being beautiful. Vines are great when you have limited space. If you can't uh, plant out, you can plant up. Um, they also add vertical interest to any landscape and again provide food and cover. Grasses are a really nice element too. They give texture and movement to a landscape. They literally help support wildflowers. They physically hold wildflowers up in many cases. Um, and they also offer seeds um, and cover to birds and other wildlife. And trees and shrubs too are an essential part of a healthy, sustainable landscape. They can be focal points or centerpieces. They can be planted together in a mass to create a privacy screen or a buffer or hedge. They also host a variety of microhabitats and provide cover and nesting opportunities for birds, small mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and insects. So again, you want a variety of plants in your landscape. Um, and so in compiling this book, we've included a variety of plants We've also looked at plants that are tried and true, easy to grow and maintain, and we have included species that we know to be readily available at nurseries that specialize in native plants. 
So there are a lot of really cool native plants out there and a lot of them might work well in your landscape, but if you can't purchase them anywhere, um, you know, it doesn't help you to get excited about them if you can't find them. So we focused on species that we know are available in the native nursery trade. Um, to find a nursery in your area, check the Florida Association of Native Nurseries website, plantrealflorida.org. Um, here you can go and um, look at native nurseries by their geographical location. So finding one that is literally in your part of the state. Um, you can also search by plant. If you're looking for a particular plant, you can type it in and it will let you know what nurseries in the state might actually have them available. Um, if you want to start from seed, uh, you can visit floridawildflowers.com, which is the Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative website. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the key to a healthy, thriving landscape is really plant selection. Choosing plants that are naturally suited to um, the light, soil, and moisture conditions of your yard will help ensure that, um, it will help ensure their success, um, it'll help reduce those maintenance requirements, because you're going to be picking the plant that is best acclimated to, um, you know, your dry, sandy soils or your wet, shady site, whatever it may be. So before you select a plant, you want to evaluate your site's light conditions, soil moisture conditions and composition, and then you can start with our quick reference guide to help narrow down um, the best plants for your site. On each of our um, profiles, you'll see a little box in the upper right corner with icons like what you see on the screen, and that will tell you uh, a lot about the plant, um, particularly if it likes full sun, partial sun or shade, um, if it likes dry or moist conditions. Um, it also gives you the plant's um, potential growth size. So you do wanna think like when you buy a plant, it's generally not full grown. So you're gonna to wanna to consider that plant's potential height and width and make sure you give it the space that it needs to flourish. Um, we also include bloom color and bloom season. So you can Select plants for year-round interest in your landscape. You can choose for you know, seasonal bloom, color, functional diversity, um, choose plants that have different colors and height, um, choose things that bloom and produce fruit in different seasons. So you'll have all those resources available to wildlife throughout the year. This is an example of, uh, of what a spread looks like in the book. So each one includes a full color, a full page photo of the plant. Um, and you see that little quick guide up in the upper right corner. At the bottom of the page, we expand on that information in the quick guide. So it gives you more details on the plant's native range, its bloom season, its growth habit, um, exposure and soil requirements. We also give you information on propagation. Can I grow it from seed? Uh, can I do cuttings? Is it divided? Um, information on the availability of plants, so what sizes are generally available, as well as how to plant them. How far apart do I need to space them to get uh, a particular aesthetic or um, to make sure that I'm giving them enough room to thrive. We include care tips, so uh, you know, does the plant need to be pruned, if it's drought or salt tolerant, can I plant it in mass, things like that. Um, hardiness zone is very important. In the front of the book, we do include a hardiness zone map, so you can find where you are in the state and then look for plants that are suited for that area. I'm here in Orlando, uh, so I'm zone 9B, so anything from 8A to 11, which is um, basically the whole state, um, anything that's suited or covers 9B is going to be okay for me, and that's going to vary based on where you live in the state. Um, we also include information on related species, um, so maybe other types of um, the plant you're looking at just to be aware of, and non-native and invasive varieties too that you might commonly find at um, your local garden centers. So that's kind of an overview on the book. Um, again, we really wanted to make it quick and easy and helpful, something that people can pick up who don't have any, have any experience with native plants and um, start finding things that they can add to their landscape. Um, I'm going to now go over some of the plants in the book. Um, I've highlighted a few that are um, particularly exciting to me, um, some of my favorites for various reasons. Um, the first one here is Florida Green Eyes. 
Uh, this is a great attractor of bees and butterflies. It blooms uh, spring and summer typically, although um, in South Florida, it can bloom year round. Um, and you're gonna see that a lot in here. We give the, the general range of bloom time, but things do vary throughout the state. So a plant that is found in both North and South Florida, you might get a longer bloom time in South Florida where it's a little bit warmer. Um, this one is really easy to establish. Um, it, it likes dry, sandy soils, full sun to maybe a little bit of shade. Um, it, once it gets established, it can form these large clumps and it produces lots and lots of blooms. So it really puts on a beautiful display. And it has a really cool secret. Um, when the disc florets, that those center flowers open, it starts taking on a little bit of a maroon color. And that's when you know it's gonna smell like chocolate. Um, this doesn't last very long, it's very subtle. You've gotta stick your nose in it to smell it, but it's a really neat thing. Um, it's delightful here. I've got quite a few in my landscape and uh, we look forward to um, chocolate time <laughs> when they start smelling. Um, but this one is also very drought tolerant. Uh, once it's established, it produces a really big tuberous root, which makes it um, very drought tolerant. So it's just an all around easy plant that works um, through most of the state. Another great one for attracting pollinators, um, and actually all the plants that we've selected are good attractors um, of pollinator and resource providers for wildlife. So I'm gonna talk a lot about that as I go through that the different um, species that the plants are um, particularly interesting to. Um, partridge pea is great uh, for butterflies. It also is good for attracting long-tongued bees, which are its uh, main pollinator. It's a larval host for the gray hair streak and cloudless sulfur, um, and it has nectar glands on its leaf stems. So the nectar it produces in this kind of awkward place attracts ants and flies, wasps, other bees. Um, so really just an amazing pollinator plant. Um, it has uh, prolific seed production, which is great for birds and other wildlife. They enjoy the seeds. Um, this one has a particularly long bloom time too. So late spring into late fall. Um, it is a short-lived perennial, but as I said, it's a prolific self-seeder. So um, this is one of those plants that if you have one, you have 10 or more because it will um, propagate, propagate itself pretty readily. Um, it's also a really nice one to have in a landscape because it's interesting looking. So it has these feathery fern-like leaves, these beautiful yellow flowers and the stems and leaf um, the stems and branches have this reddish color, so it's just a very, uh, really nice plant. It's a nitrogen fixer, so it also um, can help improve your soil, which might allow you to add other more demanding plants alongside it. Uh, we have a couple of twin flower species that are um, available in uh, native nurseries. This is oblong leaf twin flower. Uh, again, another great one for bees and butterflies. It's a host plant for the common buckeye, who actually the, the caterpillars eat both the leaves and the flowers, which is a little bit unique. Typically, it's just the leaves that get consumed by the caterpillars, but um, they do eat the flowers too, so you might see them on the plant year round. Um, it has a nice long bloom time, uh, spring through fall, uh, year round, sometimes in the south. It is exceptionally adaptable to moist or dry conditions, full sun to partial shade. It's very easy to care for. It's low growing, um, so it makes a nice ground cover, especially because it um, spreads through um, underground runners, so as well as um, producing seed too. You can mow over it, it'll come back, um, it'll produce lots of flowers, and um, it's just an all around easy plant to incorporate into your landscape. If you have a, a wet area, a large wet area in particular, this might be a good choice for you. This is narrow-leaved sunflower. Um, it gets about four to six feet tall, and in nature it forms these really dense colonies, um, which is amazing. It results the, it, um, it results in these spectacular swaths of yellow. I'm thinking um, particularly of Lake Jessup here in Central Florida. If you go there around September when these are in bloom, it is literally yellow as far as the eye can see. It's, it's quite lovely. 
Um, but for that reason, this is not a plant that's suitable for a small landscape. It spreads aggressively by its roots um, and, and will easily outcompete other wildflowers in a small setting. So um, it's great if you have a large open wet site like a wetland buffer or a lake edge retention pond, something like that is really more suitable for it. Um, it blooms late summer and fall, attracting bees, butterflies, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and the seeds are um, a nice treat for birds as well. This is one that has a natural range far beyond Florida. So it, it goes as far west as Texas and as far north as New York. So um, a lot of places that sell them, large retail outlets and national seed suppliers, um, will sell varieties that originate from out of state and their performance in your landscape can be very different than Florida ecotypes. So again, you wanna make sure you know where your plants are coming from and to ensure that uh, we recommend choosing um, nurseries that specialize in native Florida native plants. Another wet loving tall species is uh, scarlet hibiscus. This is probably our showiest native wildflower. Um, it just produces these huge red blooms, um, you know, as big as your hand, maybe bigger. They are a uh, summer bloomer, so they're um, just kind of wrapping up their display right now. The blooms open only for a day. But the plant is a profuse bloomer. So even though the bloom time doesn't last long, the plant is producing lots and lots of flowers. So it, it does put on quite a nice show. It's a really good addition to a moist or wet landscape. Um, you often see them in um, marshes and areas um, that are inundated with water. So they, they are wet loving. Um, they attract hummingbirds, butterflies, uh, lots of other pollinators too. Um, and you can propagate this with seed, with, um, as well as it, it's a self-seeder, uh, prolific self-seeder too. We have uh, four native blazing star species that are generally available on the market. And they range from dry loving to wet loving. Um, all of them are excellent nectar plants. They all attract butterflies, moths, bees, uh, a variety of pollinators. Um, and even hummingbirds sometimes have been known to uh, utilize this plant. They also produce seeds that birds eat. They bloom typically in late summer and fall. Um, now this is also a fairly tall plant. It can get up to about four feet tall, but it requires very little horizontal space. So you can use this in a small garden. It doesn't spread um, by underground runners like the other ones I've mentioned, the, the narrow leaf sunflower, for example. So um, you can contain it pretty easily. It has a really thin profile, um, an upright, stiff habit. So it's a nice complement in a landscape to rounder or more spreading forms like um, grasses, ornamental grasses, or mixed wildflowers. It, it looks really nice with them. Um, this one, if you, if you just want one amazing pollinator plant, that's all you've got time for or room for, this is probably the best bang for your buck. Um, dotted horse mint, also known as spotted bee balm, um, is really, attracts the biggest variety of pollinators I've ever seen. Um, it has a long bloom time, late spring through fall. Um, it's a prolific self-seeder. This is another one like the partridge pea that if you have one plant, you have lots of plants. If you give it the space, it will take over, um, which is a nice thing if you want it. Um, but if you don't, you can just cut it back right before it sets seeds and that will help keep it contained. Um, this plant is high in a chemical called thymol or thymol, depending on your pronunciation. Um, and it gives it uh, it's in the mint family, but it gives it more of like an oregano or a thyme, if you're familiar with the thyme herb, uh, scent when you crush the leaves. Um, and the leaves you can also make into a tea. So it has kind of a mild relaxation property. Think like uh, chamomile light. <laughs> it's not a sedative by any means, but it is a nice um, relaxing tea. So if you have this in your landscape, um, you know, you're giving back to wildlife and also uh, giving yourself something as well. 
Um, frog fruit is particularly uh, endeared to me just from my childhood. Uh, we had a St. Augustine lawn, so pretty boring, um, except for this frog fruit that popped up everywhere. And I used to love to collect the little flowers and bring my parents um, tiny bouquets. Um, this one is a very hardy plant. It does not require uh, much once it's established. Um, it's pretty tolerant of salt and wind, so it's really nice on coastal areas. Um, it's very low growing, so only two to three inches, um, but it does spread and root at its nodes, so um, it spreads pretty easily. Um, it can be a great ground cover. You can mow over it and it will come back. Um, it is valuable to pollinators, uh, particularly bees and small butterflies. And it's also a larval host plant for the white peacock, the phaon crescent, and the common buckeye. And it blooms year round, so it's, it's forever producing, um, which is great. You can put it in a hanging basket as well um, if you want to um, keep it contained. Um, and you can divide it or take cuttings of it to propagate it as well. It's super easy. Um, it likes dry to moist conditions, full sun to partial shade, um, and it just blooms um, prolifically. Another mint family plant is wild pennyroyal. Um, this is a low growing plant that um, is usually semi woody, so it, it gets a little bit of a woody structure to it. Um, the flowers are tiny, but they are attractive to bees and butterflies, and they bloom in late winter and spring, which makes this an important resource at a time of year when a lot of other plants are not offering resources. Um, that early bloom period means that pollen and, pollen and nectar are available um, when other plants aren't offering it. The entire plant is um, just so aromatic, particularly if you crush or bruise it. Um, you know, it is again in the mint family, so it has this really nice minty smell, almost lemony, and you can uh, brew a tea out of its leaves as well. Um, it's, it's highly drought tolerant. It does best in full sun and dry, very well drained sandy soils. Um, and it's almost endemic to Florida. It occurs outside in just a small area of Georgia, but otherwise it is um, entirely endemic to Florida. I think I might have said Georgia there. Um, another nice ground cover, low growing plant is uh, wild petunia. Again, great, great, great for pollinators, bees, particularly bumblebees and leafcutter bees, um, as well as butterflies. It is another larval host for the common buckeye. Um, it blooms spring through fall, or again, and that's another one that in warmer climes can bloom year round. Um, it does great in a mixed wildflower bed. And this is another one where the flowers only last a day, but it is another prolific bloomer. So it has successional blooms just coming constantly, which keeps the plant looking nice and fresh. Um, if you plant it in shadier, it, it does great in full sun too, full shade, but in the shadier settings, you're gonna get a lankier plant with a few less blooms, um, but it still makes a really nice ground cover as well. Um, this is another one you can mow and it'll come back nicely, um, or you can put it in a hanging basket or a nice um, well-drained container. Um, this is uh, in the same genus as the Mexican petunia, which is a very common uh, plant used in landscapes and commonly available at your local uh, retail garden centers. Um, that one is a category one invasive species. It is not native to Florida. Um, it has spread into municipal and natural areas and we absolutely say don't plant that. Um, a lot of sterile varieties are available and that's often used as a rationale for planting it because oh it's not plant it's not producing viable seed. Well the reality is is that plant spreads by underground rhizomes so it's going to propagate itself um, without having sterile seeds. So this isn't a direct re, uh, replacement for it. Um, Mexican petunia gets considerably taller than its native cousin, wild petunia, um, but they do work well in the same conditions. Um, and this one provides much, much more in the way of resources for wildlife. 
We have a few species of salvia or sage available. The two that we've featured in the book, uh, you see lyre leaved sage here, which is the blue flower on the left, and tropical sage um, with the red flower. These are both great attractors, again, for pollinators, um, bees and butterflies in particular. Salvia coccinea, the red one, also attracts hummingbirds. Um, They're both perennials. They're both prolific self-seeders. These are, uh, again, plants that all you need is one and you will soon have many. Um, I've got some tropical sage in, my, in a pot in my backyard where, it's, where there are pavers. Um, it's produced some flowers. It's been great, but now I've got tropical sage coming up between pavers all over the place. And it's, it's amazing. I'm just trying to get them out and pot them so I can um, start giving them away. But again, all you need is one plant. Um, they both work well, um, again, like on their own as an accent or in a mixed wildflower bedding, bed. Um, <clears throat> lyre leaf sage is a little bit smaller. It gets to about two feet, whereas tropical sage gets to around three feet tall. But they both um, bloom, have a pretty long bloom time. Lyre leaf sage tends to bloom in late winter and spring, where tropical sage is summer, fall, or uh, year-round in warmer areas. Mine have been blooming nonstop for over a year, so. We have uh, about four species of goldenrod that are commercially available. This one, seaside goldenrod, is um, probably the most readily available. Um, goldenrod gets a bad rap because uh, a lot of people think that they are allergic to it, um, but the reality is, is it blooms around the same time as ragweed, and they are often found in the same um, setting as well, or the same habitat. So goldenrod pollen isn't wind dispersed. It's really not meant, um, it doesn't get out into the atmosphere where those allergens can be activated, um, whereas ragweed does. So if you think you're allergic to goldenrod, um, I say give it another chance. It's probably ragweed that you're allergic to. Um, as you can see by the photo, it is great for attracting bees and wasps, other insects. Um, and then these insects attract birds too. So birds are, are um, interested in goldenrod because it has, it's usually covered in um, pollinators. It blooms summer through fall. Um, maybe in the spring in South Florida, again, because it's a little bit warmer down there. It's very easy to retain in the landscape. Um, it can spread by underground rhizomes, so if you let it, it can form a dense colony. Um, if you have the space to allow it to spread, it will really put on just a, a nice big show. Um, it does need full sun to get the best blooms, um, but it does tolerate some shade. It's great in harsh conditions. You see this a lot over on the coast where, where uh, sand and soils are nutrient poor, where you've got you know, full sun, dry conditions. Um, it's uh, mildly salt tolerant, wind tolerant. It's just a really great, easy plant to incorporate into a landscape. As I mentioned before, grasses are really important um, to add some movement and texture to your landscape and also to help support those wildflowers too. This is um, Elliot's Love Grass. It is um, a perennial bunch grass, so it is nice and green and full year round. And then in the fall, it starts shooting out these beautiful plumes that are just covered in tiny, tiny seeds. And those seeds are um, eaten by invertebrates and small birds. The plant itself provides coverage for um, again, birds and smaller wildlife. Um, this one is tolerant of a variety of conditions. It does great in nutrient poor soils. It's drought tolerant. It can handle a little bit of inundation as well though. Um, and like I said, the foliage remains attractive all year. So it's just a, another nice plant for um, pretty much any landscape. Muley grass, um, this is a little bit bigger than love grass. It gets a little bit taller, two to three feet tall, um, and just about as wide. But the thing that really sets it apart is this spectacular fall bloom, these beautiful purple plumes that it sends out in the fall. Um, it's another really versatile plant. It's excellent for most landscapes. Um, the foliage is attractive 
throughout the year. You can plant them in mass and really just put on a, a, a show in the fall. It's hardy, it's drought tolerant, um, it's mildly salt and wind tolerant as well, and it is a self-seeder, so it can maintain its population for many years. It's a really nice complement to um, liatris or sunflowers, um, some of the taller wildflowers that can really stand out above this, um, this bunch grass. If you live in uh, North or Central Florida, Eastern redbud is a nice tree to consider. Um, it doesn't really do well below zone 9b, so it's not suitable for South Florida. Um, it is a deciduous tree, so it does lose its leaves um, in the winter, but in spring, probably usually around March, before it leaps out, it just is completely covered in these pink blooms that you see here. Um, the flowers depend on long tongue bees for pollination, so you will see them frequenting the, um, the blooms. The seeds are eaten by birds. We can also eat the flowers and seeds. They're both edible to us as well. Um, but it's a pretty fast growing tree. Uh, it, it likes moist soils, but it can tolerate um, brief flooding as well. Um, and again, it just puts on this really beautiful spring display. It's a nice complement to a flowering dogwood tree if you have one of those in your landscapes too. So that was North and Central Florida. For Central and South Florida, I offer cocoa plum. Um, this one doesn't do too well uh, beyond zone 9b. It likes it nice and warm. It's a subtropical plant, but it is um, just an amazing plant year round. It fruits and flowers throughout the year at the same time. Um, you see it has these tiny little white flowers that are attractive to pollinators, especially bees. It has really dense foliage, so it's great cover, and its fruits um, are desirable to wildlife. We can also eat them. They are sometimes white, red, or blue. It depends. It, it kind of varies on the plant, um, but it is a plant that is it's just going to provide resources and interest throughout the year. It does great in full sun or partial shade, um, moist to wet soils. Um, it's a good plant for a hedge or buffer. You can plant them together to really um, create a nice dense screen um, or use a single one as an accent or a specimen tree, a specimen shrub. Um, it could be a small tree. It gets to about 15 feet tall, but uh, extremely adaptable, um, just really easy to grow and um, can be propagated by seeds or by cuttings as well. Uh, coral bean, this is another one of my favorite plants. Um, as you can see by the photo, uh, it's attractive to hummingbirds, as well as bumblebees and butterflies. It typically blooms in winter and spring. Um, it, it's, it's generally a an evergreen perennial, but it can be deciduous um, in certain climates. Um, but it is incredibly versatile. It's drought tolerant, salt tolerant, pest resistant, um, and it's very showy when it's blooming. It does, um, its seed does um, have some toxic alkaloids in it, so you do want to um, keep pets and small children away from it when it's seeding. Um, and its branches are armed, they have kind of small um, thorns on them, so um, it's not too hard to handle, but you can consider planting it somewhere where you want to discourage traffic or access because it's, um, you know, a little bit of a uh, deterrent. Uh, we included three holly species in the book. This one is Yalpin holly. Um, it produces these beautiful tiny little white flowers that um, bees and other insects like. Um, as you can see too, it produces a lot of fruit that uh, are interesting to birds and small mammals. And it has very dense foliage uh, year-round, so a great cover plant as well. It's the only species native to North America to contain caffeine. So you can actually make a tea out of its leaves and stems. Um, and it's a nice caffeine. There's no tannins in it. So it doesn't, you can't oversteep it and it doesn't give you that kind of uh, buzz that coffee can give you. 
um, uh, if you're interested in that, we have a local grower, Yalpin Brothers uh, Tea, who are actually wild harvesting this plant and selling the tea. But if you have one in your yard, just go pluck a few leaves off and uh, boil them up. Um, this one is another one that's great as a specimen or planted together uh, as a buffer or screen. It's, it's very adaptable to a variety of soil types. Um, it's tough under many conditions and it requires very little care. Um, you should be aware that it can sucker and form a thicket, but uh, all you have to do is just keep an eye out for those unwanted sprouts and remove them, and that will keep um, the plant in check. Simpson stopper is another, again, great attractor for butterflies and bees. You see here these beautiful little white flowers um, that are very unique, um, look like little fireworks going off. Um, they're very uh, sweet scented, so they have a nice um, fragrance when they're in bloom. The fruits, uh, which are not mature here, they get nice and red when they're ready, and they are um, great for birds, especially in the summer, um, and we can eat them too. This is a cousin of the invasive Suriname cherry, so you might be familiar with that. Um, it was used a lot in landscapes, um, but this one has a similar form to it, um, but it's native and very valuable and does not uh, disrupt natural habitats like Suriname cherry does. And it's just a really good ornamental plant, again, with dense, dense coverage or dense foliage. Um, it's fairly cold tolerant, so it's good in uh, North Florida as well. Um, and it's uh, easy to establish, very easy to establish. Um, for trees, I would say if you, if you only pick one tree, it, it's a toss-up between a pine and an oak. I'm going to get to the oak in just a minute, but um, both of them are really, really important ecologically. Um, slash pine is, uh, in particular, a really key element of Florida's ecology. It's fast-growing, it's evergreen, it provides food and habitat for uh, mammals, reptiles, um, other wildlife nesting cavities for birds. Um, its flaky bark is really good habitat for insects, which of course provides um, vital protein for other animals, particularly baby birds. Um, and most of the plant is edible to us as well. You can make a nice little sun tea out of the leaves. It's nice and lemony, uh, citrusy tasting. Um, it's a perennial, it's a fast growing plant. It's fairly salt tolerant and it's highly drought tolerant. So um, really adaptable to a variety of conditions. Um, and you can use the fallen needles as mulch too, which is really nice. This is um, you know, sand live oak. We have 26 native species of oak. Most of them are commercially available. Um, oaks are another essential uh, tree, essential plant for wildlife. Like the pine, they provide food, shelter, they support many insects, um, and again, they provide, uh, you know, the habitat for the insects that are then necessary for feeding baby birds. This is something that Doug Tallamy talks about a lot, so um, again, I recommend checking him out to learn more about the value there. Um, sand live oak, live oak is really good um, in a place where you really want a live oak, but you don't have the space. It's just like a small version of a live oak. It's evergreen. Um, it does drop its leaves, but only as it's producing new ones. So um, you can gather those and use them uh, for mulch as well. Um, the plant is a larval host for several butterflies, including the oak hair streak and the red banded hair streak. Um, it's Acorns are low in tannin and they are an important food source for many small mammals and birds too, especially the Florida scrub jay if you happen to be um, near or in that type of habitat. Salt palmetto I think is one that doesn't really get a lot of focus as a landscape plant, but um, Dr. Mark Dayloop of Archbold Biological Station calls this the most amazing plant in Florida and I wholeheartedly agree. He has documented 311 species that use it and many other species that have a relationship with it. It's extremely valuable to birds, mammals, 
wildlife, insects, um, as both a food and cover source. And its flowers are a major source of nectar uh, for honeybees. The berries are also a staple for the Florida black bear. And we can also eat them too, although they're not particularly pleasant, um, but they are edible. It is an evergreen perennial. Um, its petioles, its leaf stalks are armed. They have extremely sharp teeth. So you do want to handle this plant with care. Um, but it is a nice plant to consider for areas where you want to um, discourage foot traffic or um, other access. It works as a, a specimen plant or you can, um, you know, plant it in a group again to make like a low buffer. So these are just a few of the plants covered in the book. Um, the book covers 100 species. Um, but all of them are really great for bringing real Florida style to your landscape. You know, our landscapes are not going to look like a New England garden, but we do have a style here that you can easily create with Florida native plants and also provide those vital resources for wildlife. Um, and, you know, when you do this in your landscape, you're helping to establish and connect those corridors that wildlife need to move between and through our urban areas. So I said it before and I'll say it again, even the smallest garden can provide food and wildlife or food and shelter for wildlife. Um, as Doug Tallamy says, everyone with access to a patch of earth can make a significant contribution. So whatever space you have, um, large landscape or a tiny yard, you can do something for wildlife. You can make a contribution. There are lots of books out there on gardening and landscaping with native plants. Um, we hope that you choose ours. Um, again, we, we put it together with the idea of taking the guesswork out of going native and providing an easy to use guide for selecting planting and caring for native plants. Um, unfortunately, we're not in the office these days, so we are unable to ship directly, but you can get it on Amazon.com, uh, University Press, and if you live in Central Florida and want to shop local, you can go to bookshop.org and um, support local business as well. So with that, um, I think we'll take some questions if I can get the microphone back open, but I do want to let you all know if you if you want to check out our resources, visit our website. If you have questions or your question today is not answered, um, feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org. And then check out our next webinar, uh, September 15th, um, Saving Roadside Wildflowers. We'll be sending out some information on that uh, soon so you can get registered. Now, let's see. Pardon me while I um, try to unmute my coworkers so they can give me questions. Let's see, Lisa, are you able to unmute yourself? No, okay. Let's see, participants, panelists, unmute. Okay, there I am. Here we go. It's Lisa. Okay. Uh, we have quite a few questions and uh, we may not be able to get to all of them. Um, but uh, what are good plants for use around ponds for ducks, limpkins, and shorebirds? Oh gosh. Um, well, you particularly for, well, you want to provide cover um, for limpkins and shorebirds. So um, any Grass that is suitable for a wet area. Um, trying to think of what that might be. Um, maybe like Sakahachi grass is nice. It does tolerate wet conditions and it provides nice coverage. So they're going to have, um, you know, a place for nesting and um, be obscured from other people. Um, pickerel weed and duck potato are nice flowering aquatic plants as well as yellow canna, and they all provide um, food sources as well. Okay, um, quite a few questions about twin flower. Uh, does it require acidic soil? Does it grow beach side? Can it be mowed weekly? Uh, suitable for over a shady septic tank? 
Ooh, um, septic tank, I'm not too familiar with. Um, uh, so it does, it does like acidic soils, um, dry to moist. Uh, it doesn't really tolerate prolonged periods of water. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't plant it in a place that's going to be wet all the time. Um, I'm not sure about the septic tank. That's something that I'm not familiar with. But you can mow it. Um, the frequency, you probably wouldn't want to do it every week because you'll be interfering with the blooming. Um, but it's not going to kill it to mow it that frequently. Okay. Um, Catherine had a question about um, what are good natives for sunny, salty environments in Zone 9A, Jacksonville? Okay. <laughs> um, Sunny, salty. Sunny, uh, salty. Sunny, salty in zone 9A. Hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm so familiar with what's here in Central Florida. I haven't had a lot of experience up in that area of the state. Um, plants that are salt tolerant, um, certainly like. Coral bean is good, um, saw palmetto. Um, let's see, not cocoa plum. Um, I don't know, Lisa, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, would, I would suggest looking uh, beachside, see what's uh, thriving there. I mean, certainly Gallardia uh, is a good one. That grows throughout the state along the coast, uh, blanket flower. Um, beach verbena, that's a pretty salt tolerant one too, Brandularia. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, certainly um, taking a look at what's actually thriving on, uh, along the dunes or in that area is going to give you a clue as to what will work. Okay, Doug. Um, Molly asks, does the book tell if the plant is a self-seeder, if we can or need to collect and plant the seeds or if the plant can be easily rooted? Yes, we, um, we do address that. Um, we'll talk about whether or not uh, it is a self-seeder. Um, we do talk about seed collection. Um, in many cases, when you want to collect it and what you want to do with the seed once you've collected it, um, as well as um, you know, any tips or tricks on germinating if it's, um, if it's not just obvious, like shake the seeds somewhere. If they need to be scarified or cold stratified or anything like that, we'll include that information as well. Right, and I think that pretty much answered Judy's question about propagating by seed cuttings and layerings. Uh, did you provide um, information on that, the best time for cuttings, et cetera, in the book? We don't talk about timing. We do state whether or not the plant is easily propagated by cutting or air layering in some cases, um, but we don't talk about when. Okay. Um, do, you, uh, do you have any suggestions for propagating mimosa strigulosa other than with roots? Um, and Vicki says cuttings aren't working. Um, division, you can divide the plants. Um, you can divide them at where the new roots are establishing. Okay. Seed, the seeds do need to be scarified, so they can be a little challenging. And uh, when is the best time to collect and, and plant mooly seeds? Uh, they're going to seed in the fall after they've, after they've flowered, so that's the best time to get them. Um, you know, once the, once the flower loses its kind of purplish hue is pretty much when it's going to seed. So you, you can collect them then. And they're pretty easy to germinate as well. Okay. And then uh, what would be a good uh, companion for veggies, a veggie garden in zone 10, B, and 11? Well, with a vegetable garden, you just want to plant flowering plants in particular. So, you know, wildflowers that are, are suitable for your zone are, are going to attract those pollinators that you need for the vegetables as well. Um, you know, there's lots of, of wildflowers that do well in South Florida, and many of them are included in the book. 
All righty. Um, Sarah says that uh, she bought Wathar seeds from the Wathar Co-op but has been having trouble finding out when to sow them in the garden. Um, are there any references you'd recommend? Um, not specifically. The, the seeds from the co-op, well, at least the ones we sell, usually have information on when to plant. Um, generally, it's recommended in the fall to sow the seeds. Um, some plants are going to be okay in the spring, but um, usually it's in the fall that, that is best. Um, but the seed packets, right, Lisa, don't they usually state when to yes. sow them? Yes, they usually do. Mm -hmm. oh, and we have general um, guidelines on planting a wildflower garden from seed also on our uh, resources page, on the planting page of our website. Um, so uh, do deers eat saw palmetto and does it really grow to 50 feet? I don't know that they eat saw palmetto. That's, I'm not familiar with that um, as a plant for deer. Um, do they really grow to 50 feet? Uh -huh. I've never seen one that tall. They're uh -huh. usually, you know, three feet tall or so. Um, we've got three to six feet as our height, our, our general height in the book, um, but I've never seen one get much taller than that. Yeah. Um, uh, on Yopan Holly, uh, will the tea not make you sick or is it the berries? Um, the berries are not edible to us. Um, if you're referring to the the scientific name Ilex vomitoria, um, that's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it doesn't actually make you vomit. Um, there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> there's a long history about that and how that name came about. And um, if you're interested, I recommend that you go to Yopin Brothers Tea website. Uh, they have some nice history on how that name came about, but don't let it fool you. Um, I personally avoided the tea for years because I was afraid of that, and it's it's totally not true. Um, it's just a it's a very nice mild caffeine, and that's all. But the ber berries are not edible, so you don't want to eat them. Okay. Um, time for just another couple of questions. Um, does a book tell you what type of soil is recommended for specific species? It tells you. Each species will tell you what type of soil that plant requires or prefers. So I think I'm answering that question. Um, when you go look up a species, um, it'll tell you under site conditions, whether it likes acidic or neutral soil, um, well-drained or mucky soil, um, sandy, you know, dry. Those conditions are gonna be listed for each species. Okay, um, do you have a local link for purchasing the book? Um, just what I had on the screen. Um, some local bookstores are carrying it. So if you have a local bookstore in your area, you can check with them. Um, a lot of them are utilizing bookshop.org to purchase online. So, um, you know, check with your local bookstore to see if they, if they utilize that, if you want to purchase it online. Um, otherwise, not until we're back in the office and we're clear from COVID will we be able to, to manage that, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, Susan asks, um, are passion vines native and when do they flower? And then there was another one um, about uh, another passion vine and growing it on a uh, trellis versus how it would naturally occur. So yes, um, passion vine, the, the ones that we cover in the book are native. There is, uh, there are a couple non-native passion vines that uh, you can get at um, retail garden centers, but we have quite a few native species and a couple of them are readily available at native nurseries. Um, there, well, passion, purple passion vine is flowering right now. Um, they tend to bloom spring and summer, so we might be getting, um, you know, toward the end of its bloom season. As far as uh, how it naturally occurs, um, it, they, it will try to clamor over other plants, so a trellis is really recommended to give it some place to go. Um, I've got a bunch of quirky stem in my yard that naturally occurred there. I did not plant them, 
And um, I'm, I'm battling them right now because they're just climbing over my other wildflowers and um, they, they want to move. They want to, you know, they have tendrils, which allows them to physically grab onto things. So um, I definitely recommend a trellis if you're going to grow a uh, passion vine in your yard. Okay, dope. Well, I think that's pretty much all we have time for. <laughs> there are a lot of other questions. If, you, if we didn't answer your question, you can always email us at info at flawildflowers.org. Okay. Well, thank you all for um, attending. We really appreciate it. Um, and again, check out our website. There's lots more resources on there um, for help with selecting plants and learning about native plants. So um, be sure to check that out. And um, check out our next webinar in September. Thanks.